Hi. Uh, so today what we're going to talk about is global climate change. And uh, before we go into deep into this topic and into this lecture, for this lecture today, we're only going to focus on natural changes in order to set the framework for anthropogenic changes. Uh, one of the things about global change is that it is a constantly changing thing that is driven by plate tectonics, the atmosphere, the fact that we are a watering planet and that we have evolution of life. And so from 200 million years ago till today, the earth has looked completely different. In 200 million years in the future, it's going to look completely different again. And these things are what drives global change. So we really need to understand this aspect before we get into the deep, dark things of anthropogenic changes. So the Earth system, it's really unique in the fact that we are looking at the biosphere, life, and its interaction between the lithosphere, the rock component, the atmosphere, and the hydrosphere, the water component. All these things are interacting together, and this is what's igniting global change in our world today. So a couple of things about the Earth system is that what's unique, like I said, is that we have that linkage between physical and biological components. And this alters through time. So at the beginning of Earth, we didn't have the life component, so it looked a lot different. But when life started to be uh, a driving factor, in the Earth system, it started to change a lot. So there are a couple of categories that we're gonna talk about today. Um, we're gonna to talk about the rate, gradual versus catastrophic changes. Why is that important? Unidirectional versus cyclic type of changes. There are some things that are constantly uh, changing on the cycle, and there are some things that are just, one thing happens and it changes the entire shape of our planet. And frequency, does it happen once or is it repeated? And also the agencies, geogenic, which is what we're gonna talk about like the natural form, the rock cycle, plate tectonics, versus anthropogenic, which we'll talk about later in the next lecture. So unidirectional change. This means that there is only one direction and it never repeats. So planetesimal accretion, uh, creating the Earth, is a form of unidirectional change. We're not going to take away the earth and recreate it again. It's only created for this time period, it's for this set amount of time, and it's gonna stay that way. Another form of unidirectional change is the fact that we created a magnetic field because of the iron catastrophe from uh, iron sinking into the earth and silicon going outside, which gave us tremendous benefits, such as creating our magnetic field, which allows us to set up our atmosphere. And finally, another form of unidirectional change was the moon. Uh, we had, when the Earth was forming, we had this Mars-like uh, prototesmal planet crash into the Earth, and then the debris created the moon. And we know the moon has good implications, such as tidal changes that we find along Earth. Other forms of unidirectional change, the evolution of the atmosphere and the oceans. The atmosphere is constantly changing. The oceans, they're constantly changing. They are not the same as they were 540 million years ago, not even 250 million years ago. And that's due to the volcanic emissions and also liquid condensation to form these oceans. So we needed these things to create the world that we live in now. For instance, if it wasn't for volcanic emissions, we would not create our early atmosphere. And we think because of volcanic emissions, that helped us create the oceans as well the evolution of life. So life appeared about 3.8 billion years ago and it's constantly changing. So now we're in the time period where mammals have taken over uh, before then in the Mesozoic. 
we had dinosaurs before then in the Paleozoic, we had fish as well as amphibians and insects. And so these things have had their heydays and then they backed away. And so this is all due to the change in composition of the atmosphere. For instance, uh, we see giganticism in dinosaurs, giganticism in amphibians, as well as insects during different times of the Earth's history. But that's talking about, we have oxygen, this oxygen, uh, makes things get bigger when it's a lot in the atmosphere. It has been tremendously more than it is now, and it also allowed for things to fly. And so this thing uh, really started off from one single cell organism, and there were multiple changes that allowed, that were unidirectional, that don't happen every single day or don't happen on a cycle of 100 million years that cause us to be where we are today. So some of these physical changes that are cycles are like the supercontinent cycle. Uh, this is driven by plate tectonics, where we have a convergence of plates coming together in order to create a supercontinent. So we just, we got out of Pangaea and now we're going into a new Pangaea. So this will change um, atmospheric conditions. Not only will it change atmospheric conditions, it'll change a lot of things, a lot of other things. And this is driven by the opening and closing of ocean basins. From those physical changes, uh, we also have sea level cycles. Now sea level cycle, we do know that sea level, we have what's called a transgressive phase, transgressive phase, excuse me, where we increase sea level and then we have a sea level fall. And this is preserved in sedimentary rocks. So we can actually look at sedimentary rocks through Earth's history to understand these changes. But what's interesting is that this is so unstable that we really don't have like a definitive number. It just happens um, when uh, certain things such as mountain building events happen, uh, which can trigger sea level rise or sea level fall. Also glaciation and deglaciation events will trigger the sea level rise and fall. And just to show you how this is so unstable, we have to think about the position of the continents, how they've been moving around for so many years. And this is what triggered um, this unstableness in our sea level. And so that is extremely important in understanding global change as well. Another facet of this is the rock cycle. So we have three different types of rocks, igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic. There hasn't been really a definitive answer for this, but if you are creating, let's say, an igneous rock, um, that means more volcanism. So that means more volcanism is probably a hotter earth. Metamorphic rocks, if you're creating more metamorphic rocks, you're doing more mountain building, which kind of leads to more of a cooler earth. And sedimentary, if we're creating more sedimentary rocks, we're having more weather uh, and erosion of materials, which is leading us into a cooler uh, climate. So um, the one thing about this cycle is that it's ever changing. So rocks today will not be the rocks of tomorrow. In fact, if we look at our ocean basins, only about 150 million years of recorded uh, rocks are, I mean, I'm sorry, 150 million years of, of like history is recorded in the oceans. Whereas on land, they're mainly metamorphic, not, they're a combination of different rocks where they have different ages. So these rocks are always changing. And so these changes are over very long periods of time. And since they're over long periods of time, it also drives global change. And so you're trying to wonder like, why do you keep talking about these things? And it's going to come together soon. The reason why this is, we talked about plate tectonics. We talked about um, the life cycle. We talked about sea level rise. We talked about the rock cycle just a minute ago is that global climate change is a function of changing the water or the carbon cycle. So these changes act on these chemical fluxes that we see in non-living and living things. 
So for instance, it's just a transfer of energy or storage between reservoirs. So your atmosphere is a reservoir. Your lithosphere is a reservoir. Your rocks, your water, your hydrosphere is a reservoir. Your living organisms are also a reservoir in themselves. And so since we have these interchanging things where we're transferring energy, that's going to drive climate change. And one big focus, one is the hydraulic cycle. As we move water in between biological and physical processes, this is going to have an effect on climate that we see. So biological, all living things, we, we have an effect on it. Physical, such as the ocean, the atmosphere, surface water, glaciers, and soil moisture. So for instance, if I trap all my water into glaciers, I'm going to trigger a cooling event. If all my water is in the oceans, most likely I'm in a warming period. Similar thing is with carbon, but carbon is a little bit different. So talking about not anthropogenic uh, changes, but the traditional wisdom is that volcanic emissions and also a combination of other things, but primarily volcanic emissions is what adds CO2 into the atmosphere. We also can talk about weathering. Weathering will uh, draw down CO2 into the oceans. And um, other things such as dissolution of rocks, uh, weathering of, of organic rich rocks or carbon, carbonate rich rocks will lead to more of a warming environment. So the thing is, is that the carbon cycle, which is probably the big one where if we kind of start doing certain things to it, um, we'll begin to trigger this CO2 uh, output or draw down the CO2. Quick thing, carbon likes to be in the gaseous phase. So it's easy to push it up into the atmosphere. It's a lot harder to get it down. So that's um, one thing that we have to take into account. So we have certain, some things in carbon cycles where there are long storing periods. So limestones, fossil fuels, um, any type of organic rich rocks such as a black shell, which is used for oil and gas, as well as methane hydrates, which are at the bottom of the oceans. Uh, these are long-term storage. We're talking about millions of years, meaning that this is not a part of today's current carbon cycle. But we can release this through respiration, rapid oxidation, or burning of organic matter. Interesting enough, metamorphism is a really interesting story because we find metamorphism with mountain building events, even though it releases CO2, we oftentimes find mountain building events uh, causes or a part of pretty much global climate cooling. And another thing, degassing of CO2 from, um, from water. So this could ultimately release it. These factors could release to the atmosphere, which can cause some type of global warming event. When we talk about global climate change, like I said, it's based on the hydrogen cycle and what we're doing to our carbon cycle at the time where these storages, what is being actively stored, what is not being actively stored, what is actively being a source like the atmosphere, or is it going to be a sink like a rock or ice? And so we can measure this on long-term climate changes such as millions of years and short-term, whether it be a year up to thousands of years. So when we look at these things, uh, we use different techniques to understand uh, climates uh, and different things about them. One thing we do is what we call the paleoclimate investigation, uh, where we look at both fossils, we look at rocks, the chemical composition of rocks, what type of rocks are there, and the ages of the rocks to determine, and the fossil to determine what type of climate was there. Also, we use computer simulations, which are very good in modeling past and future changes, but this is always based on the paleoclimate that is there. So a couple of things that we can do 
is, um, like I said, look at the rocks. What type of rocks do we have? If we have a bunch of sedimentary rocks, we can determine the type of, um, for instance, coral reef like limestones. We could determine that it's a tropical marine system. Or we can look at it and we, if we come across a landscape that has a bunch of glacial till like rocks haphazardly put together, uh, as you can see in this picture, we then know that, wait a minute, that was a cold continental environment. So we can look at these rocks and determine what's going on. One of the biggest things that we use is pollen spores and megaspores. So these are abundant. We can go to any rock and we can see where these things, we can like look at them under a microscope and understand what's going on. So we look at the abundance of one type of spore versus another one. So for instance, if we have like, let's say spruce spores, they represent colder. If we have hemlock, they represent warmer. More importantly, if we look at trees, that represents a colder, drier climate. And then if we look at grasses, that represents more of a warmer and wetted, wetter climate. So we can look at these different type of pollen spores in the rock record to determine, hey, this is the type of climate that we've had. Another fascinating thing that we can use is we can look at ice. So we look at the oxygen isotope record of ice, and it's all about pretty much the theory of uh, let's say solid liquid gas, which one is more dense. So when we talk about uh, oxygen, we look at what's called their oxygen isotope. So oxygen has two stable isotopes, oxygen 16 and oxygen 18. In ice, oxygen 16 is stored in seawater or preferentially stored in ice. When we melt that ice away, it triggers or it goes back down into uh, seawater. So what we do is we look at this oxygen isotope record. So if we see, if we look at the ice, uh, I'm sorry, if we look at, yeah, if we look at ice, we can determine um, which one is it preferentially uh, create triggering. So if it has an abundant amount of oxygen 16, that means that it's a cooler climate. If we don't see as much oxygen 16 into the ice record, then we know that it is more of a warmer climate. So we can use oxygen isotopes. And the way that it works, like I said, you got to think about the density of water. Density of water goes gas, solid, liquid. And so gas being the lightest, solid being in the middle and liquid being at its densest. So if we talk about water, as we evaporate, it is easier to evaporate oxygen 16 than it is to evaporate oxygen 18. That gets onto the, that gets onto the continents, forms ice, so those are oxygen 16 enriched, and then the seawater is oxygen uh, 16 depleted. Therefore, we have more oxygen 18. Now, if we melt that seawater, we become enriched in oxygen 16, which, like I said, leads to a warmer climate. Other things that we can see, and this is true, works the same way, is we can look at coccolithophores in the rock record and figure out if we have coccolithophores that have more oxygen 16, it is a warmer climate. If it has oxygen 18 more so, it is a cooler climate. So these are a couple of things that we can use. You guys have probably heard about tree rings. The growth of the tree ring, if it's a bigger, more thick tree ring, it's gonna be a wetter, warmer. But if it's a thinner tree ring, it's gonna be probably drier or colder. So we can look at tree rings to understand differences in global uh, climate changes. Other things, we can also look at humans, study wall paintings, stories, records of harvest. Uh, for instance, this is taken out of the Sahara Desert where we see pictures and paintings of animals, grassland. So that means at one point the Sahara Desert was not a desert. Other things we can do, we can look at the hydrology and the reconstruction of stream channels. So for instance, we have what's called a braided stream, and this braided stream is reminiscent of, of water melting from ice, so you get this nice braided look. But 
this stream can change or evolve into a meandering stream, which is reminiscent of more of a tropical or temperate environment. From these things, um, we created this global temperature profile where we've actually had way more warm events than we have colder events. So we call these colder events ice houses. So currently we are in an ice house. There have been a total, we believe, about um, four ice houses. I'm sorry, five ice houses. And we're currently in one right now. And so these things, these ice houses versus these greenhouses, which is a warmer climate, are pretty much dependent upon mainly plate tectonics and volcanic activity. So some of the long-term climate changes, such as CO2 and methane as greenhouse gases because they're unaffected by UV radiation like other greenhouses, greenhouse gases. And so therefore, uh, as they build up into the atmosphere, they will allow for us to go into a more warming climate. The less CO2 that there is, the more, the cooler the climate is. And this is, um, we can go back in time and we can see this where we have more CO2. And then sometimes it, it, bounce, it what it does is more CO2 means less oxygen. And then at times where we have more oxygen and less CO2, uh, we go and let's say into a cooler climate. So these things are removing and putting in um, into the atmosphere is what's causing us to go into these warm and cooling events that can last over millions and millions of years. Another thing about long-term climate change, I talked about plate tectonics, but the position of these plates, these positions will drive changes in ocean circulation. So for instance, the reason why we're in this cooling period today or this ice house is that we close the Isthmus of the Panama, Antarctica is positioned at the bottom of the world, and we're also building up the Himalayan and out system, which is causing us to go into this climate, uh, this long-term ice house for, for right now. And so one of the biggest parts was that since the plate started, once we closed that itmus, we closed the circulation of warm water exchanging between the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean that had a drastic effect on um, climate change in the world today. So that's how we, one of the big things that we go into this cooling event, we close off circulation between the uh, Atlantic and Pacific Ocean. Other things, a long term is, like I said, mountain building and volcanic gases. When I talk about volcanic gases, interesting enough because it can be both a long term and a short term thing. So volcanic emissions, so rifting and opening up of mid ocean ridges. When we open these guys up, they are here for a long time. So that volcanic activity is going for a very long time and it's constantly emitting CO2 into the atmosphere, which is going to allow us to get into a more of a greenhouse. When we decrease volcanism, then we go into a cool house. Another thing, you remember I talked about mountain building that we find it more so because it is more of a metamorphic thing. Well, one of the things about met, uh, mountain building is that it increases chemical weathering, which increases sedimentary uh, or the formation of sedimentary rocks. And so that uplift, what it did, especially with the Himalayan system, is that it triggered the Asian monsoon. The Asian monsoon is actively eroding the Himalayan mountain system and therefore drawing down that CO2 into the oceans, which is allowing us to go into this ice house that we're currently in. So this is, um, even though I said it, this is really a hypothesis. So this isn't actually theory, is that we have um, pretty much, like I said, CO2, uh, the uplift, which is regional metamorphism. So even though we uplift it, and like I said, it releases CO2, the bigger effect is that we're eroding more so than releasing CO2 from metamorphism that is triggering us to draw down CO2 
in the form of carbonate silicate weather weathering as well as organic matter into the oceans which is going to trap it remember i said that um carbonate rocks and organic rich rocks serve as as a pretty much as a source or i'm sorry as a sink for millions and millions of years that's what's going on so that's why the uplift of the himalayan tibetan plateau triggered the um ice house that we're in and it also affected like i said created the asian monsoon and tr and change atmospheric circulation playing off of that we can also talk about the formation of coal and oil as we form this this is from the monterey hypothesis is that what we're doing is plate tectonics is acting on this so what's end up happening this is going on what we believe is going on now too is that this is causing the development of what we call our thermocline so this is our temperature gradient where it's warmer at the surface and it's stagnant and it's stably or just constantly cool at the bottom which is going to help drive um organic carbon deposition this organic carbon deposition uh like i said brings out that co2 uh, which or brings down that CO2 from phytoplankton and it draws it down and it takes it out of our immediate carbon cycle and therefore we enter into this global cooling event. Interesting enough, this is also related to black shell deposition and we call these events, even though it's called the Monterey Hypothesis, we call it oceanic and oxic events where our oceans are at the bottom are depleted of oxygen, which is allowing us to form these black shell or oil and gas or coal environments. And so interesting enough, we've had five. Uh, you can also think of now we are also in one because of the Himalayan and Tibetan plateau uh, uplift as well. That's causing um, one of these events to occur. When we talk about short-term climate change, you have to think about seasonal cycles. This is on a one-year scale. So this is what we're thinking. When you talk to your family members, they say, well, oh yeah, last year was really warm, or, oh, or this year was really cold. And then the changing of climate change differs from year to year, whether it be a warm period, whether it be a lot of tornadoes, whether it be a lot of hurricanes, versus no change at all. And then we also have abrupt climate change. These are time scales on decades. We have solar cycles, which are decades to centuries. And then we have glacial and interglacial, which are on a scale of thousands to 10,000s of years. So one of the things about short-term climate change is that for the past, let's say, million years when we've been in this constant cycle of glacial to interglacial period when we got to the Cenozoic ice house is that um we've been going back and forth between about like i believe it's like 20 or 30 glaciations and so the warmer part in these glaciations interglacial periods last about like a thousand years a couple of thousand years or so but they change often that is unlike, like I said, volcanism or plate tectonics. And so these shifts can also, and then there's also, like I said, shifts that occur on decad dec decadal scales. I want to talk about what is affecting the glacier uh, cycle and also what is affecting our most, let's say, one year, 10 years, 100 years. One thing that we can do is, as humans is we can look at the past 15,000 years, which is in the Holocene period, epoch, sorry. And at this time, we go through some really interesting time periods. Um, for instance, we can look at human history and I'm just highlighted the Oh, the five, the two, sorry, two big ones, the medieval warm period versus the little ice age. So what exactly happened during these time periods? Well, one thing that we do know is that sunspot cycles or solar output radiation from the sun happens about every nine to 11.5 years. So increasing sunspots, increased solar activity or solar output, which leads to a warmer uh, earth when we 
diminish that solar output and leads to a much cooler Earth. So this changes, and what this does pretty much is it changes our cloud cover, our albedo cover. So when we don't have as much solar output, it allows for um, clouds to form at higher elevations. And then so therefore it leads to a little bit more cooling. But when we have a lot of solar output, clouds form at a lower elevation, at least to more of a warming period. So we call these uh, cycles the Gleisberg cycle. So one of the things is during the medieval warming period uh, in, the, in about 10 to 1400, we see that um, these cycles, we were in a, a large solar output activity. And then during the little ice age, we were at a had a cooler sun so therefore we were in a cooler environment and so uh even though these sunspot cycles are going for nine to eleven years they're still on a, lo a longer term cycle where we're going to have a hotter sun for 80 to 100 years and then it backs off um for about 80 to 100 years and then it goes back in again so these are short-term climate changes that we can actually see in human history when we talk about glacial to interglacial periods, what's funny is it's actually, we believe or think it is caused by the Milankovitch cycles. So the earth is in what we call three cycles. So we call the wobble of the earth. So everybody think the earth is like this nice sphere. Well, it's not. It, it's pretty clumsy in a way. So it wobbles to the front or wobbles really widely or sometimes it doesn't wobble as much. And so this is what we call the precession. It is on a 23,000 year cycle and we can actually see every 23,000 years, we go from a glacial to interglacial, glacial to interglacial. It is like clockwork. And so as that wobble, as it wobbles like it's wobbling forward or it wobbles back if it's wobbling towards the sun you're going to have more of a warming period if it's wobbling further back it's going to be into a cooler period then we also have the obliquity this is what we call the tilt so if the earth is standing up straight then more solar output is going to the sun, more to the earth. So therefore it's gonna be warmer. But if we push that tilt back, then less solar output. So this is going on a scale of 41,000 years. And like I said, every 41,000 years, we can see, especially in the Cenozoic ice house, we could see just changes left and right. And then lastly is the shape. So our orbit. So everybody thinks we're like in this nice circular orbit. No, it actually changes drastically. It goes from more of a circular, what we call low eccentricity, or and we go to a more oval shape, which is a high eccentricity. And this is on 100,000 years. So the oval shape means that there's less solar output. So because there is less solar output, um, I mean, less solar radiation coming to the Earth. Therefore, we're going to be in a cooler period. When we have more of a uh, eccentric, low eccentricity circular orbit, then that means that there's equal distribution of, of solar radiation coming to Earth. Therefore, we're in a warming period. Other forms of short-term climate change. Um, we can actually look at volcanic emissions on a scale of years and, and even seasons that just have catastrophic effects to our climate. So uh, Mount Tempore in 1815 resulted in a year without summer. Interesting enough, there is in the United States, especially the Northeast, snowstorms being recorded June 1815. Um, the riots because of shortage of crops because everybody's crop fell during that time because we did not technically have a summer. And then if we look at a more recent one, Pinatubo, which happened in 1991, it actually lowered global temperature for about a couple of years, two degrees Celsius. So this emission from the volcano, volcanoes pretty much what we think is sulfur dioxide is used as a coolant um, to cool down the climate. So this is what I mean by short changes or short-term 
uh, climate change when it comes to volcanoes. You probably heard that once a volcano erupts, you go into a volcanic winter. That's because you have to get out all the, sol the sulfur dioxide out of the uh, atmosphere. And it does come out first, but the CO2 and the methane lasts a lot longer. Changes in ocean circulation. Um, this is related to that glacial to interglacial period. Notice I talked about the one changes in ocean circulation related to um, plate tectonics, but when we talk about changes in ocean circulation related to uh, surf, uh, related to ocean circulation, we're going back into that Milankovitch cycle where if I'm in an interglacial period, I pretty much start to not stratify, but make the gradient from the surface water to the bottom waters uh, not as, it's almost the same, so therefore it's going to change ocean circulation. If the thermocline is a hard stratified thermocline, I'm going to have a stronger ocean current. So that's going to play a big role in atmospheric changes as well as temperature on Earth. Other things that could relate or pretty much do some some things that we believe in short-term climate change is deforestation. Deforestation is going to put um, more CO2 into the atmosphere. Um, we can talk about uh, the burning of the Amazon rainforest and how Australia uh, recently was burning, and so that released a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere. Another thing that is um, unique is that we also have these methane hydrates at the bottom of the ocean. And if they release from the sediments, methane has, is a lot more of a, is a more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. And so if we release that, then it's going to trigger a um, global warming event. Also, another thing is algal blooms. Algal blooms are these big giant algae where we had these big giant algal blooms. It will trap CO2 and bring it down, but mostly what we think that really is uh, crucial is especially like deforestation and methane hydrate release have more of a potent effect on the environment than uh, algal blooms. So what I mean by methane hydrate release. So the idea is that if we warm the ocean up just enough to release this methane. That methane, like I said, carbon is an atmophile. It doesn't like to be in a solid phase. It likes to be in the gaseous phase. So it will escape from the ocean sediments if we warm up the climate or we warm up our oceans enough and it will release into the um, atmosphere. There are a couple of times where we think this happened. We think it happened in the Permian-Triassic extinction. And this is when the earth went from a greenhouse to a hot house. So these um, type of changes are pretty catastrophic. And which leads me to um, the last point is that, for instance, other types of catastrophic changes that are short term, such as a bullite impact or what we call the open, the onset of opening up an ocean basin like a flood basalt, which is a massive volcanism uh, activity, is going to trigger the world to go into different types of global changes. So um, when we talk about the Cretaceous tertiary extinction, the dinosaur extinction, this is when we believe that um, this type of change blocked out once this once the meteorite hit it blocked out sunlight which prevented any type of growing any type of thing which um, was a factor in killing off the dinosaurs other types of what we believe are changes sometimes they're not related to global uh climate change like earthquakes and tsunamis but um they can trigger changes to the environment because they are devastating um, in ways. And that is it for uh, this lecture. Um, like I said, tomorrow we will talk about how humans play on these changes and which we can present different problems. So I hope you enjoyed it and thank you.